Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's a real honor to be here. Uh, I've been uh, working with Drake Music for many, many years, not so much recently, um, but through the DM Lab project that some of you might be familiar with, I... Microphone change again. Oh, battery. Batteries. One, two, two. Okay, good. So, where was I? Uh, I used to make lots and lots of music and work with Drake Music because I was obsessed with technology. And really, I realized I was trying to build that spaceship of my dreams from when I was about five years old with all the blinking LEDs and buzzing things and twisty knob stuff. And here I am still doing the same kind of thing. Um, so what I've got for you today, I'm going to talk about a project uh, which was a series of hackathons that we ran in partnership with Big Creative Academy, which is a sixth form college in Walthamstow. And this project was funded by the Foundation for Future London. They, they get a lot of money, I believe, through uh, the whole Westfield, Stratford, kind of East London thing. But they work a lot with the Culture Mile and the Museum of London, City of London, and all of those people. And they're really big on pushing fusion skills, increasing the employability of young people through those soft skills that are not necessarily easy to mark, easy to gain a qualification in. And lots of people are saying our young people are lacking when they finally make it to the place of work. So that was a really big focus for this project. I'm going to demo. I've got two versions of this because we ran the, the, the hackathon twice. I'm going to demo the first one and then talk about the hackathons and then demo the, the other one at the end. And uh, Tim at the back here, I had the absolute honor of Tim helping me a lot with this and joining me for the second one. Actually, two of them, didn't you, Tim? Brilliant. Uh, OK, so the first one, if you can see this crazy mess over here, some of you might know. Oh, that's my screensaver, maybe. Damn. All right, two seconds. I lost the battery on the laptop here. In my haste to set up, Dad, would you give me a hand? While I'm chatting, could you unplug that and plug that in? Thank you, Hugh. All right, so you can still see this, which is genius. Uh, this, some of you may be familiar with, it's uh, a node-based, which means you drag the boxes and you draw cables, uh, audio programming software, very similar to something called Max MSP, uh, which was a fork from the original version of this. Now, this is used uh, across universities and by lots of hacky and makey type of people because it's free and open source and it runs on a huge variety of devices. So you can run it on microcontrollers uh, like what I've been using here. Not exactly this one, but lots of the Arduinos and the Raspberry Pis. You can run this natively, not need to plug anything in, and it will just run. Right, brilliant, Dave. Okay, Dab, I still need you here a sec. When this reboots, Dab, can you just uh, choose the third option down and go to Windows for me? Brilliant. Okay, so I'm going to hopefully make some sounds with this, and let's see what happens here. So I'm using uh, a Raspberry Pi Pico for this, which is a tiny, tiny, uh, what's it the size of? It's the size of a smu a, a, it's the size of a few big spiders. That's that's the thing that's coming to my head right now. It's tiny, uh, but incredibly powerful, and it's running something called MicroPython, actually Circuit Python, which is a variation on that. And this thing really flies. It really runs fast. <laughs> and in two seconds, I should have some sound coming through for you. OK, now if you can see my screen, down in the bottom here, there's like the diagnostics going on, so I can check if it's talking. And this thing, this contraption that you'll see in a minute, it's mimicking a MIDI controller. So the microcontroller is pretending to be a MIDI controller, and my laptop's picking it up as if it was a keyboard with buttons and sliders on. And then we're coming through into pure data, which is this Max MSP spaghetti type of stuff. And here we go with the sound. So, 
I'm going to twist my pots. I'm going to connect up the MIDI. Okay. And now you can hear that loop. That's just the voice playing, and that's the sample that's going on over there on the left. And I'm twisting the pot and just changing the playback speed. Okay, and so I've got buttons that use like presets, and so depending on where I bring this to, it's going to trigger different things, and then what else do I have here? Then I've got capacitive touch, so I've got a tiny, tiny circuit board which I'm going to try and hold up here, and this is acting like a uh, make you make you. some of you might know what a make you make you. this is like a tiny version of that, and I've just got these uh, cables hanging out, so when I make contact with that, it changes the capacitance and it acts like a button press and again I could be triggering different samples it just so happens to keep it simple I'm working on one sample that goes round and round and round I'm just going to log in here Dav saved me with the presentation let's see if that's going to come Anything? Zoom the zoom, yeah. I'm going to turn that down, so that must be um, getting on your nerves as much as mine. Uh, if there's a master fader, Hugh, you could pull that down for me. Right, sorry about this, everybody. I forgot to plug in my laptop, and it died. Sometimes it's the simple things. Right, hopefully I'm joining the Zoom. Join, join, join. And then we can really get started. No audio. Mute myself. Right, what do we see, Cat? Are we in? Can you see the presentation yet? Okie dokie. How about now? What can you see? Can you see the Zoom thing? Oh, you just need the presentation there. And we're away. Thank you. Right, I'm really sweating. Uh, okay, so to the presentation. It's called, it was called Life Bites, and the idea was to really inspire and demystify hardware for young people. What we found is that a lot of young people that we're working with had never even considered coding. So that was an extra bonus in a way. But the idea was to like explode an iPhone, all the sensors, the processors and, and demystify what's inside that mystery box that we all have in our pocket. Uh, and so, as I said earlier, the, the fusion skills was a huge thing behind it. That was the hook that we were able to build upon. The hackathon thing was just something that I've, through, through stuff with DM Lab, really fell in love with this idea of uh, like-minded people coming together to learn, to share, to have fun, to work on a, on a shared challenge, and then share at the end of it. And so as a format, the hackathon has got so many elements, um, and it's something that I want to build upon and build upon and build upon. So here's what the fusion skills are. I'm not going to go too deep into it. Uh, so we wanted to inspire, so we made some videos. We set them a, a, a video challenge. The whole thing was about uh, thinking about their art form in the future particularly thinking about AI and VR and the way things might be heading. Uh, so we set them a video challenge alongside this to really kind of do a, a deep dive on what their art form might look like in the future. 
so they'd have something to draw upon in the hackathon as well. Now, this is a great picture, if you can see that, of, uh, of what? Is it, are you able to pin uh, something there for me? Could you pin that presentation at the moment? Of the device, and as you can see, I wanted, I wanted the young people to kind of feel like they might get electrocuted. I wanted them to kind of feel like, oh, is it safe? Can I touch this? Um, to really help with that demystification process. Uh, so I wanted them, I had this phrase in my head of wanting them to get their hands dirty with code and electronics and really like be working on as low level as we could possibly um, with the time and the lack of experience that they had. But I had my own issues, obviously, uh, which is being incredibly enthusiastic but not really having a huge amount of coding knowledge to draw upon. Uh, so I, I lent heavily on Tim and Gowin. Some of you might know Gowin. Um, and also ChatGPT. I used extensively uh, generative AI to help me with the coding process. And this was revolutionary because I had it acting as a mentor. I had it acting as a, a monkey, like just bashing out code for me that I could copy and paste, stick into my editor, run, copy and paste the errors, fire them back over to Jack. ChatGPT, fire the new code back over, and sometimes I'd be going for four or five hours a night just trying to get things working. And what I realized is you really have to hold its hand and build features incrementally, but that makes so much sense. That's the way you'd build anything. You wouldn't just dive straight in. Um, and again, a big shout out to Goan and Tim. So uh, I had to decide, I had this idea, but I really had no clue uh, what the hardware would be. And I wanted to dive back into this world, having not been into it for really like two or three years. Um, so I had to decide on what to use. So in the end, I settled upon this tiny thing. This is the uh, spider's uh, size of, how many do you think? Six? Six or seven spiders? Big ones. Um, and the reasons are mainly because it was so cheap. These things cost about six pounds. That's with the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth enabled. And they've got super fast processor because I wanted something that really felt fast. Not felt fast, felt real. Often when you're controlling things, a lag and a delay really separates you from the experience. And I wanted these young people to go and the whole color change or the size change or the sound really is instant. So I wanted really fast processor. Uh, there's a huge uh, ecosystem and community, because this is from the Raspberry Pi Foundation, and they do things properly, and, and there's a real uh, buzz around this device, and loads of people are using it. The chip, I think it might be the black thing in the middle, is used on all sorts of other boards as too, the RP2040 chip. Um, anyway, I won't go too deep into that. If you, wanna, if you wanna ask me any questions, please do. One of my things, reasons for coming and sharing this is to connect with other people who are interested in this stuff. So if you've got any interest in it, please come and um, ask me later. I, I came across two main companies for the sensors, Adafruit and Pimeroni. I think I said that right. Uh, I went with Adafruit in the end, mainly because of their circuit Python. There's kind of like a, uh, what would you say? Like a, fac a faction, if that's right. Um, MicroPython is a version of the programming language Python that runs on these tiny computers really fast. Uh, and, and they couldn't agree exactly on how to do it, maybe. So Adafruit took their own version, so that really works well with their ecosystem of sensors, and that's the way I went in the end. Um, what did I do? I'll skip that. You don't need to know that necessarily. Uh, but the main thing is it went really, really well. Um, it was touch and go. I was working on it until 2 in the morning the night before, as, as I often do with these things. Um, but the, the response from the young people was overwhelmingly positive. Uh, we, we didn't just make it about geeking out with electronics. A big part of it was about thinking about the future. We set them a challenge for the last part of the day to, to say, like, knowing what's inside some of this hardware, knowing how simple coding actually is, what could you build if you had no budget restrictions? If you had no budget restrictions, if you had if you had infinite expertise and resources, what would you build? How would you change the world? And so it became a huge kind of like blue sky thinking, 
lots of uh, drawing and writing and stuff. And then each of the groups presented back to each other uh, the kind of thing that they'd love to build. Um, really cool, interesting, unusual ideas. Um, we got some lovely quotes. We got a huge number of people involved. Uh, but I won't bore you with that too much. Um, so what's next really for me is I want to run a lot more of these things. If anyone's got any ideas uh, where to take the format or take the tech, one thing I should say is uh, with the work with DM Lab and the work that Tim's pioneering and Rob's pioneering here with Hugh is I wanted something that could be plug and play, have a brain, have a, a, have a, a, a collection, if you like, of different sensors that could just be connected in and almost instantaneously start being able to control stuff so that we can build bespoke stuff for an individual so that we can uh, have a toolkit, kind of like a Lego set. This was in my mind, was having like uh, a Lego kind of kit for uh, assisted music technology. That was a big driver behind this whole thing. Um, so one thing I'm thinking is, of is instead of having it look quite so um, like it might give you a shock, is to build a custom PCB uh, because, I don't know if you know what, if I go back here, those of you that aren't too familiar, you can see the thing that the chip is sitting on. Thanks, Kat. These tiny holes there, you, you stick pins in, and they have a tendency to not quite keep their connection when they're being transported in big boxes in cars and stuff like that. So there was always a little bit of nerves at the start of every session, running around, seeing which ones aren't working, reseating the pins, all that kind of thing. Um, it was remarkably re reliable considering, but I think that would just give an extra element of like uh, security to the whole thing. What else? Uh, one thing I'd love to do, and if anyone is interested in helping me to do this, would be to open source the whole thing just to share everything I've learned, all the code that I've generated, uh, but I really am not clear on exactly how GitHub works, what the best practices are and that kind of thing. Uh, but the main thing for me is to connect with like-minded people, people who are into this stuff and are fascinated in this for whatever reason, then, um, then please come and say hi and uh, let's start chatting. And that's it. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you. Sorry about the, um, uh, I don't know what to call it, the madness there. Um, I mean, uh, we're at TM out. Lab. It's all about technicals, and we can have uh, issues. It's the simplest and... of things as well. This one got plugged in perfectly, but I forgot to plug in the laptop anyway. Well, we've gone through lots of batteries on our microphones this evening I somehow, did. so cool. I don't know how that happened. But yeah, we're getting there. I've got the microphone Very back. Good. So um, any questions in the room or on Zoom? Yeah, Deborah. Right, so um, Kat's asking on, on, on the chat, potentially naughty question. How do you feel about using AI, which uses machine learning from other developers and coders to build something for music slash creativity, which is also currently steeped in controversy regarding AI? It's a great question. Um, where I sit on the AI thing is, uh, a slightly more abstract metaphysical thing, uh, which I'll go into as, I, as it comes out right now, is I kind of feel like we're all um, nodes in one huge AI structure. We're all out here on this planet exploring different parts of it and sharing back what we find and building connections and building these kind of things that we're now building as large language models and generative AI. Um, the issue is that one company is making all the money from everybody else's stuff. I think that's something that we need to figure out. Um, but in terms of the, the, what's most exciting for me is the ability to build things and create things for individuals. Uh, we're really lowering the, lowering the barrier of being able to take an idea and make it into a reality. And that's what's really exciting for me. And the ethics are not right. And there's no doubt it's going to displace millions, billions of jobs. That's for sure. Uh, I don't think we're ready for what's coming. Um, I have this vision of like a tsunami that's like the earthquakes happened way out at sea. 
and a tsunami is rushing towards us. And most people are, are oblivious that it's still coming at frightening speed. Uh, exactly how it's going to change the world, I don't know. Um, but I'm, uh, what's the word, dangerously optimistic about nearly everything. And uh, I'm looking for the ways it can help me to create. Test, test. Okay, thank you um, for the answer. And Kat also says in the chat, there's a thing called GitHub Desktop, which is a little more user friendly. It's effectively like Google Docs, but for code. Awesome. Brilliant. Thank you, Kat. I'm going to check that out. Do you want this one, Rob? Questions in the room. Yep, brilliant. Okay, well, we'll do some back and forth with Dave. I actually coded with AI last night for the first time ever, and I found it equal parts empowering and like, like that I'm tiny in graphic code. So it was it was really interesting. That that like, it just points a big finger at you, saying how bad at code you are, as you receive code from this robot who's made of code. It's really weird, but it's worth trying. My, can I ask my question, which is. Um, did you, I'd love to know about the engagement of the young people. Um, did you find it difficult or easy to engage them? Sometimes I've found that some people just don't care or they've not got it in them, in their, in, in their life. They've got too much going on to care about what's going on in this workshop. And I'd love to know about that. And then also what do you think, maybe you choose one or two that they came away with from the workshops? Cause it's quite an, it's quite a, niche geeky thing which seems really obvious to us a lot to like plug in circuits and make stuff but to some people it's like oh, what do i do with this i'll try and if i can remember both i'm going to start with your last one because that's fresh in my mind um so in terms of uh what they took away the ideas that they were coming up with and part of this was because we designed the whole project to give them ammo in a way so we didn't want it just to be, oh, here's this crazy abstract thing that's kind of cool, but what am I going to do with that? So that's why we set them this video challenge project. Uh, we gave them a whole bunch of resources about um, converging technologies and how things are moving faster and faster because different technologies can come together and create things that weren't possible before. We did a bit of a look in the recent past to how things were and how rapidly they'd changed. And we got them to create these videos uh, of how they saw their particular art forms, because this is an arts college in, say, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. So they already had a good idea of where their art forms might be going. Some of them brought it back to their art forms. Oh, I could create something really cool for my dance piece. Uh, hopefully in a sec, maybe I won't have time. Uh, but the other side of this was not sound, it was computer graphics. And so it was using uh, P5JS which is like a JavaScript version of something called processing. And it was getting things moving around and flashing and, and jumping around and drawing on the screen, but again, using the same system. Um, help me with your last question. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this was a fear of mine, because these guys are uh, 16 to 20 years old, the majority of them around 18. It was in the last week of their second year at college. So lots of them are kind of, they would have in the past just been bumming around waiting for whatever's next, waiting for summer to begin. Um, I was pleasantly surprised. There were maybe, uh, I'd say, 5 to 10% who were very apathetic and not really interested. Uh, but the vast majority, I think because of the way we structured it, we came in and we showed them what this stuff could do, just like moving things around the screen. But then in the resources, we had them uncomment lines of code. So you can kind of disable lines of code. So it's there potentially, but it's not active. And so we had them uh, just uncomment lines of code. And in terms of like a brain chemistry kind of learning journey, there was a little bit more dopamine dripped through to them. And then they'd like uh, follow some guides I'd made and they'd 
uh, write in a different number in the variable. And all of a sudden, the output was very different than it was before. And all they'd done is changed a number or two. Because I wanted to give them this feeling that they were coding, but without having any knowledge of what code is and how to structure it. So they were, like I said, getting their hands dirty and changing things and, and, and seeing an immediate output that they could then control in real time with this hardware. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, a lot of them were really buzzing, which I was terrified of, uh, but, but it seemed to work out. Great questions, thank you. I was just wondering if you could share one of the potential futures that your students imagined with us at the end of the project. The only one that's in my head right now that, and this was, I think this was the winning one for some reason, uh, because this was back in July, was um, it was a device to, um, <laughs> it was a device to encourage slow walkers to move faster, I think. If you're an 18 year old and you're trying to get where you need to get and people are just taking their time, uh, a lot of these students found that really like irritating to the point where that was the one thing they would change in the world. And um, I think it was a series of like escalators like you get in the airport, like overtaking lanes, but I think there were also some lasers involved just, just to really get the encouragement happening. Um, and that was certainly not the most uh, positive one, but it's the only one that's stuck in my mind right now, but thank you for asking. Yeah.